Hello, welcome to this video on the residual income model. The residual income model can also be called the discounted abnormal earnings model, so I'm going to use those two names interchangeably. To value a company, one of the methods that's available to us is the residual income model. And the residual income model is a very powerful valuation method because it looks at the earnings of the company and specifically if the earnings the company is generating are higher than its benchmark required rate of return. So a firm creates value when it earns a return higher than its cost of capital. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about a very simple example. If I go to the bank and borrow money from the bank at an interest rate of 4%, and then I go and invest the money that I've borrowed into a project that generates a return of 4%, then all I'm doing is generating a return that pays back my cost of capital. It pays the interest rate. I'm not actually creating any new value from that. So for me to go to the bank and borrow money at 4%, to actually create value, and when I talk about creating value, that would be something that increases the share price or increases the total value of the business, then I would need to invest my money into productive operating assets that generate higher than my 4% cost of debt capital. Okay, Similar with equity. If I go to equity holders and they expect a 10% return and I invest the money they've given me into productive assets that generate a 10% return, that's not going to increase the share price. It's not going to increase the value of the business. It will just leave the value of the business as it already was when the money was raised from those shareholders. Okay, so firms create value or they increase their share price when they're capable of earning a return or profit on their operating activities that's higher than their cost of capital. So the residual income model focuses on this. It focuses on if a business's profits are going to be higher than expected based on their cost of capital. Here's the residual income model formula. It says the value of a firm's equity, so VE stands for the value of a firm's equity, is equal to their owner's equity in time period zero, so time period zero means the current time period, the most recent balance sheet that you have access to. You look at the balance sheet and you see their owner's equity balance. And that's going to be the first term of the formula. Plus, in the brackets here, NI, the net income or the, the profit of the business in time period one. So that means next year. We're forecasting the net income one year ahead. Minus RE is the cost of equity capital times owner's equity in the current time period zero. In this term here, in the brackets, this is what's called residual income. So net income in time period one, our forecast profit next year, is compared to what we expect the business to earn based on their owner's equity, what's been invested into the business, and the required rate of return or their cost of equity capital. So if my business has $100 of owner's equity this year, 2020 is time period zero, and I have a required rate of return of 10%, then my $100 of owner's equity times my 10% cost of equity capital, my earnings would be expected to be $10 for the year. If my forecast net profit is higher than $10, let's say $13, $13 net income minus 10% times 100, 10, we would have $3 of excess or abnormal or residual income. Okay, all those terms are interchangeable. My earnings of 13 were higher than my expected earnings of 10, so I've generated a residual income. So that's what is term in the formula here. Up here, this is the residual income. It's called the residual income model, and we're figuring out are our expected earnings or our forecast earnings higher than expected based on our cost of capital and the amount we've already invested into the business. Then we do the discounting. We do the present value calculation dividing the residual income by one plus the cost of equity capital to the power of T, however many time periods we need to discount it back. The only other term we need to look at is the terminal value. Okay, and we'll talk about the three different methodologies available to calculate a terminal value. And that gets calculated in a future year and needs to be present valued as well. Okay, so that's the residual income model mathematically. So how is it derived? Where does this come from? Well, most valuation models are based on present valuing future cash flows. And we know that if you're a shareholder in a company, the cash flows that you receive from the share, from the owning shares will be the dividends that the company may pay you. So the dividend discount model is our first valuation model that we look at. And the, one of the most popular ways of valuing a business is the dividend discount model. However, with a little bit of algebra, we can turn the dividend discount model into this residual income model. So if we assume clean surplus accounting, and clean surplus accounting refers to when 
all of our changes in equity are driven from the income statement. So kind of like what you learn in accounting A when you learn that our beginning period equity plus net income minus any dividend will equal your end of period equity. Okay, and that's done with the comprehensive income statement. That's the purpose of a comprehensive income statement to show this claim surplus accounting. If we're looking at the dividend discount model, okay, we've got dividends are equal to net income plus equity last year minus equity this year. If we rearrange and substitute the, this term D into the dividend discount model and rearrange and do some algebra, we'll actually come up with the residual income model. And in words, it'll say the equity value of a business is equal to the book value of equity plus the present value of expected future abnormal earnings. Okay, so the textbook will show you how you can do that algebra and rearrange it if you're interested in just seeing how you could substitute this term in for dividends into the dividend discount model and come up with the residual income model. So just to reiterate the term residual income or abnormal earnings, these are interchangeable terms just to make sure you're clear on what it means. If a firm invests in a project where the actual return equals the required return, that doesn't create any value. It doesn't increase the firm's share price because that's what is expected. So I used the example previously. If I borrow money from the bank at 4% interest and I invest it into a project that only generates 4%, that's not creating value for my business. It's not increasing my share price. It's just paying back the interest. Okay. If I get money from my equity holders and they expect a 10% return and I invest in projects that just generate a 10% return, they'll be happy. They're getting the return they, they want, but it's not going to lead to an increase in the firm share price. Okay. So a firm creates value when they earn a return higher than their cost of capital. And we calculate that, we calculate the abnormal earnings or the residual income by comparing the net income in a period minus the cost of equity capital times equity in the previous period. Okay, so at the start of 2020 this year, I have $100 of equity. I'm going to use that $100 of equity to purchase assets and run my business. And then at the end of 2020, I'll look at if my net income was higher or lower than expected. So that's why there's a timing difference here. The net income is the period after the equity. Okay, this is time t minus one because that equity was used to invest into the business to generate the earnings over the following 12 months. Okay, so just remember there's that time period difference here. Okay, so let's look at actually applying the residual income model. We've got the formula here. Step one, forecast net income and owner's equity. Okay, so in the formula, we've got the term owner's equity in year zero. That's from the current period balance sheet. You can just look at the balance sheet and get the owner's equity in time period zero. That's this year's data. But then over here, we need owner's equity forecast one year into the future and then future years as well. Net income, we need next year's forecast and future years as well. Okay, so when we talked about forecasting and we created a forecasting template, you'll have a net income and owner's equity forecast that you can use and substitute into these. Step two, estimate the cost of capital for equity and calculate the discount factors. So this RE term is your cost of equity capital. We'll talk about how to calculate that in a future topic. Step three, calculate the residual income. The residual income refers to this top part of the formula here. So you've got your net income forecast, you've got your cost of equity capital, and you've got your owner's equity for year zero or owner's equity forecast into future years here. So it just means put the numbers into this top part, this numerator, and click enter and figure out what is your residual income for each year. Okay, so getting that top part of the formula. Step four, calculate residual income growth patterns and make an appropriate terminal value assumption. So once you've calculated your residual income for each year, years one, two, three, four, five, you then need to think about what patterns are occurring here. And do you think they're likely to continue into the future? Do you think your business's residual income will continue growing in the future? Will it stay the same or will it shrink down? Okay, so there are all the options that you've got for your residual income in the future. You need to think about, based on your knowledge of the industry and your company, what's most likely to occur. Based on your terminal value assumption, which will go in here, you can then calculate. Step six, you then discount the residual income. That means we, the residual income that we've calculated up here, we then divide through and do the present value calculation for each of those, okay, including present value in the terminal value. We then add up each of those discounted residual income numbers plus the original owner's equity, and that will give us the value of a firm's equity. 
So after I've explained the residual income model in that prior slide, the main thing that will, is still uncertain will be the terminal value calculation. So the terminal value can be calculated three different ways. The first case is the terminal value is just equal to zero. So in this formula, we've got our discounted residual income for however many years we forecast. Then after our forecast period, we say our terminal value is going to be zero. The second case is we just believe the terminal value, the residual income is going to stay constant. So maybe we've forecast six years into the future and then the terminal value residual income is going to be whatever it was in year six and it's going to stay at that number forever for hundreds and thousands of years into the future. The third case is the residual income can continue growing. Okay, so the residual income at T plus one has grown and so we have to divide through by the cost of equity minus the growth rate there. Okay, so let's talk about when these cases are likely to occur. So the first terminal value case under the residual income model is if the terminal value would be zero. Now this is a very different terminal value assumption compared to a dividend discount model or a discounted cash flow model because we're saying in this case the residual income will be zero in the future. Now this can lead to a bit of confusion because if we think about how residual income was calculated, residual income was this part of the formula the net income minus the cost of capital times owner's equity. So a residual income of zero could still be a very profitable business. We could still have a really high net income, but our net income will be equal to what's expected based on our equity investment and our cost of capital. So a residual income of zero doesn't mean it's a bad business. We could still be a profitable business. We're just not generating a return higher than our cost of capital. And economic theory would say this will occur in highly competitive industries. So when there's a lot of industry competition or when there's government intervention uh, preventing the market from operating in a certain, certain way, then we might have zero residual income. So when you do introductory economics and you learn about monopolies versus perfect competition, one of the definitions of perfect competition is that firms are not able to earn a return higher than their cost of capital. So residual income of zero will be likely when you believe that the firm's going to have really, really strong competition or strict regulation from the government that will not stop them from making a profit, but stop them from regularly earning a profit that is higher than their cost of capital. The second terminal value case is when that residual income maintains a constant rate in the future. So the business you're analyzing you believe has a sustainable competitive advantage. Maybe there's accounting conservatism, which is lowering the book value of the asset, so the owner's equity is artificially low. We believe that the residual income will be positive in the future, and the company has a competitive advantage that will be able to maintain it, but they're unlikely to be able to grow the market. So it might be a really mature industry or a mature market that doesn't have much growth, or any growth that's occurring is highly competitive but your business does have a competitive advantage. It is generating a residual income. However, it's unlikely to grow that regularly in the future. And the final case is residual income growth. And this is quite rare. So again, this is very different from a dividend discount model with growth or a discounted cash flow model with growth. We know that dividends can grow. We know that cash flows can grow into the future for a long time, but residual income growth means that our company has a competitive advantage and they're still able to maintain that and grow their profits faster than their equity times their cost of equity capital. So this is a rarer case to have high residual income growth for forever. We've got those really special companies like Amazon and Apple and those really high value companies that really do have something different. So when talking about the second terminal value assumption, I mentioned maybe we had conservative accounting and I'll use that as a segue into this point. When we're valuing a company using the residual income model, we have to take into account the accounting the firm is using. The residual income model is using the balance sheet, the owner's equity balance, and the income statement, our net profit to value a business. And because the net profit and the owner's equity on the balance sheet are both influenced by our accounting decisions, we need to understand the firm's accounting before we use this valuation model. We must understand that the valuation is based on both the earnings and book value. All those accounting choices we need to know about that affect those two items will therefore affect our valuation. So if our business that we're trying to value is engaging in biased accounting and they're engaging in earnings management, boosting their profits and boosting their asset values, then that will flow into our valuation as well. Whereas a dividend discount model or a discounted cash flow model aren't really influenced by the accounting choices of the firm. Okay, so an accounting analysis is an important step to uh, precede the residual income model.
So why would someone use a residual income model to value a business? Well, there are actually a lot of advantages and it's one of the best models we have to value a business. The academic research actually shows that this method can often outperform many of the other models. And some of the reasons for that is that it focuses on the value drivers of the business. It's focusing on both the balance sheet and income statement measures of performance. It's actually focusing on the profitability of the business. So this is different to a dividend discount model or cash flow, which is focusing on the distributions of the business. This is actually focusing on if we're able to generate profits in the future. So using the balance sheet captures any of the prior investments the business has made. Looking at the profits of the business in the future captures the ability of the firm to generate returns that may be higher than their cost of capital. If you're doing an accounting major, you've learned a lot about accrual accounting. And the good news is accrual accounting can actually be beneficial to us. And by using the accrual accounting information on the balance sheet and income statement, it allows us to better recognize when value is added to a company and matching value to uh, value added to value loss is actually a benefit for our valuation. So using these financial statements does allow us to improve our valuation ac accuracy. And finally, it's aligned with what people forecast. Analysts are spending a lot of their time forecasting firms' earnings. What is the firm's profit or their earnings per share going to be next year? They spend a lot of time thinking about the profitability or earnings potential of companies. And this model can directly use those inputs into the valuation process. So that's a really big help for us as well. Finally, there are some disadvantages to the residual income model. The accounting complexity. We're using accrual accounting information. We're using the balance sheet and income statement. I just listed that as an advantage. However, we know from prior frauds and accounting disasters that accounting can be complicated, it can be biased, and it can be misleading. So it's a plus and it's a negative depending on which company you're looking at there. So suspect accounting can always trip us up. So if our accounting statements we're relying on aren't telling us a true picture of the economic reality, our valuation is going to be very biased as well. So overall, I hope you understand the residual income model formula. It's a valuation method that values the equity of the firm using the owner's equity of the firm, plus the present value of all the future forecast residual income. We have to do a terminal value calculation, thinking about these three different terminal value choices. And then you have to know the advantages. When is this, when is this valuation method likely to create an accurate valuation for a company compared to some of these disadvantages of when it may not be as useful as some of our other valuation models. Thank you very much.